Good afternoon, everyone. I always do that. I always forget to turn off the laptop. I'm having a bit of a boogie here on the on the live stream. It's Jim here at Two Studio HQ, welcoming you to our 100th live revision blast. And how fitting it should be the economics team to deliver their 18th live revision blast because uh, they've been on this program right from the start. Amazing, amazing sessions. Catch them all on the replays if you've missed any of the previous ones. And just looking at the chat window, we've got loads and loads of students who have committed to a late start on a Thursday to do some development economics. So a particularly warm welcome to you. Of course, if you're watching on replay, then uh, hopefully you're having a, a good holiday or a summer or winter. Who knows when you might be watching it. Uh, and you can always pause the video to give yourself a bit more time on these uh, questions and activities. But those of you in the live chat, under pressure, I think. Um, so a big warm welcome to uh, Holly, who's bottom left. You, I'm sure you've all seen Holly before. And of course, Isabel, bottom right. And my body double, Jeff, top right, uh, who will... Uh, Jeff, do you want to give us a, an introduction to development economics? What we're going to cover in the next 30 minutes or so. Yeah, thanks, Jim. This is one of my absolute favourite topics development economics. So there's a huge amount to cover here and um, we've got lots of different activities for you. Uh, we'll, we'll just kick off, Jim, and uh, here we go with our first exercise. If you get a chance, please always type your answer into the chat window. That's always a great uh, great support to us. This is our missing vowels round where we, we've kind of uh, taken the vowels out, literally, of a series of economic concepts. And your job is to try and type the correct answer in. And normally we get the presenters to pronounce the missing vowels. I think you'll see why it probably isn't going to work today. Here's our first one. And the answers are flying in already. Absolutely flying in. And this is a nice, easy one. New development. That sounds like, sounds like right. Jim, can we get the right answer, please? 
It is indeed the Human Development Index created, co-created by the great development economist Amartya Sen. The HGI database, an absolute treasure trove of information on countries at different stages of their development process. The Human Development Index kicks us off. Let's have our next missing vowel, please, Jim. OK, I'll give you a clue. The second word here is GDP. I just want to help you. I'm feeling particularly generous today. So what is the uh, what is the missing missing vowel there? What do we reckon on this one? And the answers again are coming through. Uh, Jim suggested garden GDP, which I don't know where you dug that one up from, Jim, but a good effort. And the uh, correct answer coming through. Yeah, we've got quite a few already coming in. It's actually Ben's gone in with the correct answer. Let's have the answer, please, Jim. The answer is green GDP, not garden GDP. Now, this is really good. Please do take a moment to add this to your revision notes. Green GDP is a hugely important idea when discussing things like sustainable growth, sustainable development. What green GDP does, it tries to put a monetary value, hard enough for the best of times, a monetary value on the estimated loss from things like um, collapsing biodiversity and the costs of associated with climate change. Of course, some countries are more vulnerable than others to, to climate change and the destruction of natural capital. Let's move on to our third missing vowel. What do we reckon here? We've taken the vowels out. And if we include the vowels, what answers do you get? So we've had Human Development Index, we've had Green GDP, Rebecca and Mine and ooh, a load of people, Ronald storming in. Let's have the answer, please, Jim. This answer is the Human Poverty Index. I hope you're thinking, what is that? Well, of course, poverty is a multi-dimensional concept. And the United Nations does now publish a multi-dimensional poverty index, not just about per capita incomes and per capita consumption. It's many different aspects. I think something like 10 different aspects of extreme uh, poverty encapsulated into one index. It's a really interesting bit of information. By the way, we'll post links to all of these indices in the comment section of the video right at the end. And let's have our final missing vowel. Here we go. Now, again, we've taken a few vowels out, not many. What do we reckon for this one? Team Economics working very quickly already and putting the answers in. What do we reckon is the, this missing vowel? Mm. And Pavit's got it. Rebecca's got it. michael has got it very quickly. Superb. And the answer, please, Jeremy, is coming through now on the liquid display board. There it is. The Gender Inequality Index. Now, the Gender Inequality Index measures our gender inequality, clearly, but in three important aspects of human development. Hugely important to in include this in your wider discussion. So they, they try and track pro progress in reproductive health, for example, cutting maternal mortality and, and adolescent birth rates. They have a measure of empowerment, including parliamentary seats occupied by females, percentage of females with at least some secondary education, as well as economic activity, including things like labour market participation, uh, crucial indices. And of course, we can now adjust the human index, human development index for aspects of gender inequality. Let's move on. We've got a little cluster of multiple choice questions for you. Here's the first one. Which of the following are characteristics of a less economically developed country? You're looking for an answer here, A, B, C or D, which, has, which are all correct. So in some of them, there's a mix of correct and in incorrect characteristics. So what do we think for question one? So we're looking here for an answer, A, B, C or D, just one answer, where all three aspects are characteristics of perhaps a low or a low middle income country. And the answers are coming through. There seems to be a nice consensus. Let's check the answer with Jim on the, on the production desk. The answer is indeed D, uh, lack of sanitation, low GDP per capita and high birth rates, something like a million and a half, billion and a half people in the world still have do not have access to basic sanitation. Open defecation in the streets is a, is a huge issue in many, many countries, many cities, particularly, of course, in in the areas where urbanisation is, is not, infrastructure is not catching up with urbanisation. Here's our next question coming through, doing really well. The Human Development Index, HDI, is a composite index consisting of what? 
Take a moment, please. And if you get a chance, type your answer into the chat window. So what is the correct composite of the Human Development Index, the HDI? If you're doing this uh, on the replay, hundreds of you will be. Take a moment, just press the pause button, choose your answer, and then we'll go through the answer together. So what is the correct uh, composition of HDI? We've got some answers, mainly C. Let's just double check with the answer coming through. And indeed, the answer is C, uh, human development. Index. Of course, the, the weighting is the same for each of those components. And there's a debate about whether the weighting should be changed in some sense to give greater emphasis to certain characteristics of development. And here's our third, uh, final little multiple choice question in this section coming through. A definition of economic development includes which of the following? So take a moment, have a go at question number three. Post the answer in the chat. Those of you watching live, what do we reckon? A definition of economic development includes which of the following? Really appreciate it when people post the answers in chat. It's fantastic. We get some feedback. And uh, we know that Team Economics is a pretty special group. Loads of answers coming through. And if we can have the answer, please, Jim. Yes, all of the above. All of the above would be characteristic. That was great to see people getting that right. Uh, crucially, development is essentially about trying to grow and sustain people's economic freedoms and capabilities and capacities. It's a wonderfully interesting area of study at A level. I think all of those three aspects would be important definitions of development. Well done, Tim Economics. Fantastic start. I'm going to hand over now to, to Holly for the next exercise. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So what we've got to do here is work out the four groups of phrases here. So have a little bit of read of all the 16 things up on screen. Try and group them into four groups of four. And if you can figure out what kind of fits in a group together, try and figure out kind of the overarching title of the group. So do we think coffee, could that go with subsidies maybe? Or do we think it's maybe kind of fitting with import substitution? Have a little bit of go and write down your groups of four in the chat. As Jeff said, super, super great to kind of hear your thoughts and hear your answers to these questions. Okay, so a couple more moments to see if we can kind of have any kind of guesses as to what could be grouping together. Do we think kind of coffee, cocoa maybe? They seem like they could work well together. Maybe kind of maybe not so good with nationalization. And then we've got a couple of answers coming in. Now Charlie's come up with a few, mine's come up with a few as well. Fantastic. Very, very good, and Rebecca as well. Great work from Ben as well. So can we have the first set of answers, please, Jim? So I think this is the one Rebecca got, where we link diarrhea, tuberculosis, malaria, and AIDS as diseases that disproportionately affect developing nations. So for instance, tuberculosis, 95% of cases and deaths from TB actually occur in developing countries and malaria, for instance, 51% of all cases actually occur in six developing countries. So Nigeria, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Tanzania, Burkina Faso, Mozambique and Niger. And again, HIV and AIDS, two thirds of people live to more than two thirds of people who have it live in sub-Saharan Africa. So fantastic for kind of our first set on to our second set of answers to group number two, please. Fab, so we've got our next group and they are examples of cash crops, which are, these are kind of crops that are given to crops grown for profit and not for kind of subsistence farming. So, I mean, for instance, coffee, there's 125 million people dependent on coffee for their livelihoods. So it's a really kind of key example of a cash crop. Okay, on to the, the third group, please. And we have our third group, which are interventionist strategies to drive growth. So these are policy strategies where the government plays a really, really active role in allocating all of these resources. So import substitution, kind of making sure a country kind of switches away from importing goods to more kind of domestic 
production, nationalization. Again, we've seen this quite a lot in micro, so some good overlap here, moving away from the private sector into the state into the state sector as well. Subsidies, again, a really, really good link with kind of some micro topics from earlier in the year, which we have done a revision session on as well. And so this is kind of helping farmers to kind of have more investment due to stable incomes. And finally, exchange rate manipulation. So this is where you're trying to keep our currency artificially weak to lower the price of exports, making them more competitive, maybe resulting in export-led growth. I'm going to give you just a couple more seconds. We've got the last four kind of highlighted, the ones left and white. But can you think of what links them? So what could link the Jubilee Debt Campaign, the International Monetary Fund, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and the International Development Association? So what's kind of the link with these four? Have a quick go and type it in the chat, everyone. So I think some of these have probably kind of been more well-known than others. The IMF, kind of really, really well-known, actually had its first kind of female leader, Kristalina Georgieva. Sorry for kind of terrible pronunciation of her name, but kind of the first woman in the post, which is obviously great for kind of dealing with some of the gender inequality we were spoken about. So we've got kind of some answers coming through, IGOs, promoting growth, developing countries, lots of really, really good answers. Jim, can we have the final link, please? And our link, lots of people getting this on right. So they are all development promoting institutions. So we've got kind of the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development and the International Development Association, both kind of providing loans as part of kind of this World Bank kind of group. The IBRM providing kind of loans to middle income countries, whereas our International Development Association, they're providing loans to the poorest countries. IMF kind of more generally reducing poverty, promoting trade, um, promoting high employment and economic growth. These are all of their aims. And the Jubilee Debt Campaign, one of these ones I find really, really interesting. They are campaigning and the debt of the poorest countries to be cancelled. So one of the big successes of this was in 2000, 20 billion pounds of international debt was cancelled. But in 2019, it's still kind of a pressing issue. In 2019, total kind of global debt was worth 101 trillion pounds, oh, sorry, 101 trillion dollars. And as the chat says, likely to be even bigger following kind of lots of spending post-COVID. So on to Isabel for the bubble quiz. Yes, yeah, some great work there. Now we're on to the bubble quiz, the more sophisticated cousin of the multiple choice question. So like a multiple choice question, we'll give you a question with four possible answers. However, it might be that none of them are correct. It might be that one of them are correct or two or three, or it could be that all of them are correct. So we'd like you to type the letters of the ones that you think are correct into the chat. Let's have a look at this first question. So which of the following are direct consequences of corruption? So we've got higher interest rates charged by banks due to a lack of collateral. We've got absence of property rights. We've got lower income elasticity of demand of exports. And we've got an unfair allocation of scarce resources. So Type the letters of the ones that you think are correct. If you don't think any are correct, you can put a zero. Let's see what you think. So Rebecca's gone straight in there for D. Remember that there can be multiple correct, or is that a, is, am I leading you astray there? We've got lots of people saying B and D now. We've got Rebecca or, and we've got Ben, we've got Georgia. We've also got Charlie there saying B and D. Is anyone gonna step away from B and D? Is anyone going to be brave enough to try something different to everybody else? Still lots of B&Ds coming through. Alina, Ronald, Harvey. All right, let's have a look at this answer then, because everyone seems to agree on B&D. So the answer was actually A, B and D. So let's start with D, because I think lots of people said that. Um, if there's corruption, if that means if the government is acting to maximise the welfare of those in power or their cronies, instead of um, 
maximizing the welfare of the country as a whole, you might end up with um, more unfair allocation of our scarce resources. Those resources are more likely to go to someone in power. A and B are kind of linked because if your government isn't acting in your interest, you might not trust that your property isn't going to be taken away from you at any given point of time. Um, so that links to the B, the absence of property rights. But because of the absence in property rights, that means that um, the banks who would normally give you secured loans can't do that because the, there's nothing to secure the loan against, which means that lending to you is much more risky. And that's why the answer there is A, B and D. Let's have a look at the next one. Which of these institution, which of these are institutional factors affecting a country's economic development? So we're looking for institutional factors. We've got exchange rates, we've got infrastructure, we've got import substitution, and we've got education. What do you think here? How many of these do you reckon are true? Can you type the letters? It might be zero, it might be four, or it might be anything in between. Which letters do you think are true? We've got as if straight in there on B and D. B and D is very popular at the minute today. We've got a B, C, D. We've got an all of them. We've got an A, B, D. We've got loads of different combinations coming in here. We've got Pavit. We've got Alina. Tom thinks they're all true. Sabrina thinks it's B and D. Okie dokie. Let's have a look at these. Yeah, so institutions are part of the fabric of the economy. They're well-established structures and arrangements. So it's often good to look for the really long-term uh, elements here, long-term factors. So we've got infrastructure and we've got education, both really long-term factors that affect the structure of the economy. Okie okay, dokie, okay, let's have a look at the next one. Ben's doing really well here. Can he make it for three? So which factors does the Har Harrod Domar model say the growth rate of an economy is linked to. So which of these factors are in the Harrod Doma model of growth? So we've got property rights, we've got access to credit and lack of debt. We've got the efficiency with which capital can be used. And we've got the level of savings. Which of those factors does the Harrod Doma model say so the growth rate of an economy is linked to? As if straight in there again with D, he's always the first one through. And Georgia's saying D as well. A little bit less certainty over this one, it seems. But still in agreement that it's D. Sabrina's gone for D as well. Let's see if anyone else is going to say anything else. We've got a BD. We've got a CD for Mikra. Another CD there. Let's say the next three through. Ronald's gone for BDC. Ben's gone for BCD. The same in a different order. Okay, let's give it a go. Let's see what our answers are. And we've got C and D. So the Harrod Domar model stresses the importance of savings and investment for long term growth. So it says that the, the rate of an economy's growth depends on the level of savings. So that's D and the productivity of capital or the or the capital to output ratio, which is really saying the efficiency with which capital can be used. So it's not using the same words that you might have come across, but really it means the same thing. It's how much can you make with the capital that you've got? How efficient is your capital? So the answers were there were C and D. OK, I'm going to hand back to Jeff. Oh, thank you. as well. making a great case there for the bubble quiz being an essential part of any future A-level assessments, we think. And likewise, with these questions, we've got, uh, I think, a little trio of questions for you here where we give you two statements. And your job, your challenge is to say whether the statements are true or false. And obviously, the A, B, C answers a, B, C, D answers depend on which combination of false and true or true and true, etc. you think. So here we go. Here's the first one. Let me read the statements out for you. One advantage of tourism as a pathway to development is that demand in the industry is income inelastic. And statement two, the prebish singer hypothesis states that an over-reliance on exporting primary products, such as cash crops, is not an effective long-term development strategy. So which of those statements are true? One or both of them? Uh, is it what combination of true and false do you think? Post your answer in chat. Uh, if you think both are true, you would post the answer A. If you think they're both false, you'd post the answer D or something in between. What do we think on the uh, 
on this first one. And it looks as if, looking at the answers coming in from Joe and Jingy and Sabrina, it looks as if most of you are going for C. Well, let's double check with our production engineer, Jim. By the way, a big shout out to Jim. He's on the clicker today. He's doing a good job. It is indeed C. It is indeed C. Very quickly on this one. Uh, income, what you want as a tourist sector, you want a strong income elasticity. That's as people's incomes go up, the demand for your tourist sectors goes up. So you're looking for that income elasticity, not inelastic. The Plebish Singer hypothesis, that's true. Uh, it argued this, by the way, this came, this theory came out in the 1960s. Uh, I know that because I was there at the time. And it suggests that there's been a long term decline in the real prices of many commodities, extractive commodities like copper or rubber or tea. And therefore, you should move away from commodities and, and try to industrialize and grow your economy that way. The Plebish Singh hypothesis that is true, but in reality, you know, many, many commodity prices have gone up in value in the last 10, 15 years. In fact, you can make an evaluative argument for saying the volatility of commodity prices is more significant as a growth and development barrier. By the way, the answer there is C. Let's look at the second combination of statements. Here we are. Statement one, some argue that debt for low-income countries may lead to moral hazard. And statement two, multilateral aid involves a donor country sending aid directly to a recipient country. What do we reckon on this statement question number two? Take a moment, post your answer in chat. Two statements there, which is true, which is false, which combination? What do we think on this one? A few answers coming through. People saying either A or B. So A is both statements true, B is statement one is true, statement two is false. What do we reckon? Uh, it's a tricky one here for a couple of people changing their minds. Ben, who is rapidly turning out to be our perhaps our most prolific attendee and poster, superb economist, judging by his answers. He's gone for B. Well, let's see if Ben's right. And the answer is indeed B, superb. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, uh, statement one is, is correct. There's a, a danger of moral hazard if you cancel debt in the sense that uh, those people whose debt is cancelled might be take higher risks going forward. Part of the debt jubilee discussion that we talked about a few minutes ago. Multilateral aid, sending direct, no, multilateral aid is when, a, is when a range of countries or perhaps operating through a development aid organisation such as UNDP, they send aid to a recipient country. Uh, bilateral aid is when one country sends aid to another country. And here's our final little statement question. Income and wealth inequality can slow growth in developing nations due to the poorest in society struggling to borrow to start businesses. Statement one and statement two, capital flight results in lower tax revenues for the government in addition to lower domestic investment. So here's our question three. What are we going to go for here? A statement about inequality and a statement about capital flight. What do we think? Which is true? Which is false? Which combination thereof do you think? Moss is coming with A pretty quickly. What do we think on this one? A few more seconds. Uh, a few people saying A question mark. Um, okay. Well, let's have the answer, please, Jim. Jim thinks it's A, and indeed it is A. Yeah, I mean, the good good statements there. Uh, this this whole discussion about the extent to which inequality is a barrier to growth, particularly in terms of financing businesses, for example, and the extent to which, of course, development and growth amplifies inequality. The, the correlations and causations can move both ways. And capital flight, the movement of financial capital out of a country, can reduce tax revenues. You know, for example, the portfolio investment into banks and property and things, if that money leaves a country, the government may get less tax from that wealth, assuming, of course, these investors to pay their taxes in the first place, which is a, a dangerous assumption to make. OK, great stuff. Superb work on those questions. I think we're ready for a new activity. So I'm going to pass over to Holly. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So on the grid in front of you, you've got 12 different options and you need to read these options and figure out which of these are criticisms 
of using national income data. So for instance, GDP, GNI, GNI per capita, GDP per capita as measures of development. So which one of these are criticisms of using national income data as measures of development? So do you type your answer in the chat? Some of them are pretty lengthy, so don't kind of write down all of them. But for instance, if you wanted to write out, do not, does not indicate the distribution of income amongst the population, don't bother with all of that, pop C3 in the chat instead. And so when we're doing this, it's really important to kind of remember what we mean by development. So we spoke a little bit about this earlier, but it's something a little bit more than economic growth. It's about kind of well-being, quality of life, freedom of expression, all of those kind of things. So remember when typing your answers in, development a little bit more. Okay, and so we've got some answers from Charlie B2. So does not include data from the hidden economy, potentially a criticism. Any other ideas? Oh, and Ben coming in with a stellar set as well. And Georgia coming in with loads as well, 2A. So doesn't include information about people's leisure times. And we've got a lot of three Cs coming in. So lots saying does not indicate the distribution of income amongst the population. And now that B2 coming in, lots of people thinking kind of hidden economy, that's a big flaw. Here, we'll give it a few more seconds to see if we've got kind of any other options. We've got kind of a 3A coming in. So 3A, that's talking about kind of, uh, sorry, doesn't include the cost benefits created by externalities. We'll give it a few more seconds and then we will have Jim reveal the answers to us. So have a guess, have a go, but we'll go five, four, three, two, one. Can we have the answers please, Jim? Fantastic, so the ones highlighted in yellow are our criticisms about using this national income data. So we don't have any information about leisure time, obviously a huge factor in someone's well-being and their quality of life. And again, talking about cost benefits created by externalities. So we want to know a bit more about pollution. We want to know a bit about healthcare. All of these things creating externalities. Uh, it doesn't include any unpaid output. Again, very, very important, particularly if we're thinking about kind of caring housework, maybe some implications about gender equality going on there. There's also the voluntary sector and subsistence farming, which obviously may be kind of key in developing countries. And another criticism is that, and which lots of you correctly identified, is that it doesn't include data from the hidden economy. And that could be super, super important because the IMF estimates that 32% of total GDP could actually be part of the hidden economy. So really kind of a key problem that it doesn't kind of deal with in national income data. And last but not least, not it doesn't indicate the distribution of income amongst the population, as you saw in the previous question, potentially kind of a limit, a, a limit to growth and development. So it could be used by kind of including a measure of inequality, maybe kind of including the Gini coefficient as well. And our other four kind of are actually advantages of using this method, not necessarily criticisms. So we are now on to Isabel for our next activity. Thank you very much, Holly. So we've got on balance up next. All good economists need to be able to weigh up multiple factors. And so this should give you a bit of practice at that, this time looking at debt relief, which we've mentioned a couple of times so far. So to start with, we want you to type into the chat potential advantages of debt relief for low income countries. So type in potential advantages to low income countries. And I was going to ask you to type in two each, but given that we've got the elite team in today, clearly, I'm going to challenge you to see if you can come up with three. So type them one at a time. But let's see if you can come up with three potential advantages to low income countries of receiving debt relief. Off you go. So Holly and Jeff have both said earlier that there are lots of calls for debt relief this year in light of the pandemic. Um, but it's not actually as clear cut as you might think, as we'll come on to in a minute. It's perhaps not as easy or straightforward as you might think. I haven't seen any through yet. Let's let's see your advantages. The advantages of debt relief 
to low income countries? Why might we want to cancel the debt or reduce the debt of low income countries? Oh, you got problems? Has got the answer again. He, he's on form today. He was on form on Tuesday as well. It can reduce inequality. What else have we got? So reasons, reasons in favour of cancelling the debt or relieving the debt in low income countries. Is anyone going to join? You got problems? He's he's going in for a second. He's going in for reduced poverty. Rebecca's come in now as well with eliminating the opportunity cost of interest payments, allowing it to be spent on development. Ben's saying that it reduces possible tax burdens that might stifle growth. The inconspicuous goat is saying that government spending is encouraged. S some bloke called Jeff has said that for many countries, debt interest payments may exceed what a country spends on healthcare. Um, and as I've said, that it can reduce the burden. Let's have a look at what we've got. So we've got two potential advantages. Let's see what we said. So we've said that governments can invest more in capital goods and infrastructure to raise growth. We also said that lower debt repayments mean more that can be spent on those crucial public services, so healthcare and education. And as Jeff said earlier, that that for many countries, debt interest payments exceed what they actually spend on healthcare. So if they can spend less on those interest payments, they can spend more on healthcare. And Holly mentioned some of the healthcare issues that they might need to be spending that money on. Okay, let's have a look at the other side of the uh, the argument because it's not as straightforward as as just that that there's only one reason to um to have debt relief. So now we're going to be having a look at potential disadvantages to low income countries of debt relief. Why might it not be a good idea for for debt to be cancelled in low income countries? Why might it be good for debt to be relieved or to have some minimised in low income countries. Ben's gone straight on there with moral hazard, which we mentioned just a few slides ago. And Bino is saying the same thing as well, moral hazard. Charlie's gone for something different. He's saying that it increases a country's reliance on other countries. Um, Inconspicuous Goat is saying that a dependency could make policy make it, makers lazy and un unsustainable. All some really, really interesting arguments here. George has come back for a second one. So many low income countries are corrupt. So the debt relief could be wasted as citizens won't see any improvement. And we discussed some of the potential consequences of corruption earlier on. Let's go for just a couple more. What else have you got? It seems like we've got fewer people commenting here, but the, the core economists are really going for it now. Who else wants to give it a go and suggest a reason that might be a disadvantage for low-income countries for receiving debt relief? Why might low-income countries not want to receive debt relief? Why might it be a bad idea, perhaps, in the long run? Um, Okie dokie. Come on, let's just give you a couple more seconds. Rack your brains. What might be the disadvantages of debt relief? Particularly important right now. And as I've said, that it can affect their credit rating. So that's an interesting one, how that then they'll be able to get credit in the future. Okie dokie, let's have a look at what we put here as our answers. Okay, so we've said that the increased spending that results from debt relief may not be as effective as, ta as targeted aid at increasing development. So it might actually be better to spend the money on, say, healthcare directly rather than relieving the debt and then allowing the governments to choose. And that might be particularly the case if we've got corruption, because then we know that the money is going to get where, it, where it's needed. Whereas if there's large levels of corruption, then the money that we relieve through the debt might then be spent on um, on those in power or their cronies and might not be spent in a very effective way and not using that scarce resource in a very effective way. We've also said that debt relief granted by the high income country may be used to exert influence over the low income country. And this is something that we do see. Often that debt relief is tied. It, it's tied to conditions saying you'll buy this from us and you'll consider us for this. So it's, there are lots and lots of issues going on here. And on the, on the surface, it sounds like a great idea. And in many ways it is, but it's really really important to make sure we get round some of those disadvantages. Okay, I'm going to hand back to Jeff for the short straw. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, great discussion. And as always, I've been given the short straw. But actually, this is a game called Don't Draw the Short Straw. Now, we, we can all play this. 
and I'm going to invite my fellow presenters maybe to have a go at this as well. So you're about to see a question with four possible answers, and those answers can be ranked, and your task, if you choose to accept it, your task is to choose the third ranking item. If your choice finishes first in the list, you get one point, finishes second, two points, third choice, four points for you. If your choice finishes fourth, no, don't draw the short straw, zero points. We've got two for you. Here we go. Let's have a go at this one. Which of these countries is the world's third largest coffee exporter, measured in metric tons, of course? So which of these would finish third in terms of a listing, a ranking of the world's biggest coffee exporters? And the four countries we choose from are Colombia, Vietnam, Indonesia and Brazil, which would be a pretty fearsome FIFA qualifying group. In fact, these are all major coffee producing countries. What do we reckon here? Can you type your answer into the chat window, please? Which is the third largest coffee exporter to get four points? Let's see if anybody in this uh, wonderful group, Team Economics, can somebody come out with eight points? What do we reckon? Uh, Charlie's gone for Indonesia. Rebecca has gone for Colombia. Sabrina, uh, Colombia. Uh, ooh, so the, the, the mode lancer here seems to be Colombia. Uh, ben Long, one of our great contributors, Ben's gone for Vietnam. So, Jim, here we go. Here's the answer coming up on the liquid display board. And the answer is Colombia. Congratulations. A large number of the group are in for the maximum eight points. Yeah, Colombia is the third biggest. Uh, what are we talking about here? Brazil, the biggest, presumably Vietnam. Actually, Vietnam has now become one of the world's biggest coffee makers, exporters. Indonesia was fourth. You avoided that one. Okay, one more. One more example of the short straw. Here we go. Which country of these four has the third highest, highest life expectancy out of this list? So you need to rank these countries by life expectancy at birth. If your choice finishes first, you get a point. If it's second, you get two points. You're looking to get the third choice to, to pick up the four points, but to avoid the short straw because you get zero if, you, if your choice finishes fourth. So what do we think? What do we think? People are suggesting the previous answer it was Brazil, but they want a VAR, but we're not having VAR in this quiz. Which country has the third highest life expectancy out of this list? Presumably the life expectancy of these countries is fairly low, but we're looking for a ranking. Jack's gone for Ethiopia. Ronald's has gone for Afghanistan. It's George has gone for Equatorial Guinea with a question mark. John's gone for Ethiopia. Charlie Richardson's gone for Afghanistan. Well, here we go. Let's have the answer. And the answer is, the top answer there is Equatorial Guinea came third. Uh, South Sudan was the fourth and the highest was Ethiopia. Big spread of, of years there. Uh, countries, of course, uh, well, South Sudan and Equatorial Guinea, average life expectancy. And I'm 58, so I would be nearing, you know, nearing the end in those countries. Of course, one of the crucial issues there is not necessarily the average life expectancy; it's the, it's the uh, the healthy life expectancy that one can expect to to uh, enjoy, and that's often in many of these countries substantially lower than that. Well done if you picked up uh, eight points in the short straw quiz. I think it's time for red herring. Superb. Love the sound effects there. So we're going to go for a red herring. So you are going to see four fish on the board. You, three of the fish has something in common. One does not, hence the name the red herring. So you need to figure out what the red herring is and kind of what the link between the others are. So is the red herring can create multiplier effects, can help to fill a savings gap, can reduce absolute poverty, or may lead to dependency. So have a little bit of a think, type the letter in the chat. So which one is the odd one out? And can you think of things that kind of link the other three together? So absolute poverty, obviously a key definition for economics. And this is defined by the World Bank as living on less than $1.90 obviously adjusted for power purchasing parity a day. So we've got some answers coming in now. So we've got D, Ben is saying 
is our red herring. Mine saying A is our red herring. And we're getting some answers as to kind of what links the others in as well. So Ben saying kind of the rest are advantages of aid. A couple more Ds coming in now saying that one is our red herring. We've got a C as well as a potential for our red herring. So we'll give you a few more seconds to try and figure out which one is the odd one out, but also what is kind of the idea that links the other three. So five, four, three, two, one. And can we have the red herring revealed, please? Fantastic. So D was right. That is kind of our big red herring. A, B, and C are all advantages of aid. A can lead to kind of economic growth, boosting national income. B, reducing poverty. Obviously, kind of an advantage of aid, a big aim is to reduce absolute poverty. And C, again, kind of linking back to the Haradoma model that we spoke about earlier to kind of finance investment projects. And D is our red herring instead of being a disadvantage rather than an advantage of aid. So well done if you got that right. On to the second red herring, please. Okay, some superb sound effects as the fish kind of make their way in. So is A, an inelastic supply of goods? B, can increase real income per capita? C, volatile commodity prices creates uncertainty? Or D, greatly affected by protectionist policies of trading partners. So as before, which one do you think is the odd one out? And what links are remaining three? So have a go, pop your answers in the chat. So looking at A, we've got this inelastic supply of goods. So that's a really, really steep upward sloping supply curve, PD kind of between zero and one, pretty, pretty, small there. Then we've got commodity prices, maybe could be linked to kind of our cash crops that we saw earlier. So talking about kind of coffee, cotton, maybe something to do there. And they've got our real income per capita for B. So remember that's dividing our total national income by the number of people in the country. So by our total population. And then we've got D about protectionist policies, so kind of stuff to do with trade barriers, trying to prevent free trade. So we've got some answers coming up in the chat now. Lots of people saying A is our odd one out, so the inelastic supply of goods, and a couple of others going with B, so it can increase real income per capita as our odd one out. And we've got a couple of kind of explanations as well. Rebecca saying that A isn't related to primary commodities and B saying look actually all of our others are relating to I assume we're meaning primary product dependency when we're going with PPD so again a couple more people saying B is our odd one out so we'll give a few more seconds and then Jim can you reveal our answer please fantastic so lots of you are right B is our odd one out today. And Ben, well done. The link was disadvantages of primary product dependency. So this is when a kind of a country or an economy is really, really dependent on the extraction or cultivation of primary commodities. So this can be stuff like oil, it can be kind of minerals, it can be metals, or it could be kind of goods. So it could be kind of, it could be coffee, it could be cotton, our cash crops earlier. And when we mean dependent, to be a little bit more specific, this could be kind of dependent in terms of their GDP, in terms of their exports, or dependent in terms of their employment, if it's a really, really big employer within a particular country. So we've got A, C, and D, all linked to primary product dependency. So A, kind of, if there's a bad harvest, it's really hard to kind of get jobs, to get kind of money from that. And that in turn contributes to see this really, really, really volatile prices, creating a huge amount of uncertainty for farmers, potentially falling investment as a consequence of that. And then D, these countries are super dependent on exporting all of these primary commodities 
in order to receive kind of either foreign exchange or to increase their aggregate demand. So again, really, really concerned with trade barriers. And B is actually kind of a pro of primary product dependency. So if we consider the Zambian economy, they're really heavily dependent on copper, but copper has increased in price significantly since the 2010s. And so that has potential to lead to increasing real income per, cap income per capita for people living in Zambia. So fab work for the red herring, everybody. And over to Isabel for higher or lower. There's only one way to finish off the 100th revision blast. And that, of course, is higher or lower, as Holly said. So I'm going to actually ask Holly and Jeff to come and play with this one. So it'll be you against them. Uh, so you need to type an, a, an H or an L into the chat. What we're going to be doing is looking at um, countries ranking on the World Happiness Report. So we're going to see, first of all, Let's have a look at where the UK came in the World Happiness Report. So the UK was 13th. I'm lucky for remember some. That, <laughs> I'm lucky for some. Remember that the World Happiness Report is made up of lots of quality of life factors, but interestingly, is also made up of subjective questionnaire results asking people how happy they think they are. So really interesting here. Let's have a look at the next one. So Finland. So I'm going to ask you guys to type in first. Do you think... Finland is is better than 13th or worse than 13th type in h or l into the chat and then we'll see what you say we'll compare that with jeff and holly we'll see if you guys should be on here instead of us well higher per capita income is substantially but but uh, i don't know dark winters and uh i don't know is there much unfinished uh, tv these days <laughs> i've heard they like reading don't they i'm gonna go i think their happiness is a little lower actually I'll go so lower. you're going to go. You're going to go lower. That's interesting because uh, our economics team on YouTube today are often all saying higher. What about you, Holly? What do you reckon? I think I'm going to have to side with team economics. I think it's higher. I think when I think of Finland, I think kind of lots of fish. That that would make me happy. So <laughs> I think we'll have to go higher. All right, let's have a look. Let's see who's right, whether it's you guys and Holly or Jeff. And it is in fact you guys. Okay, so let's have a look at the next one. Well, when I said lower, of course, I meant the ranking was lower in terms of one being lower than 13. <laughs> oh, well, of course, that's what you meant. No, 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 um, no, no. Finland's actually been, I think Finland's been in number one for a couple of years now, three or four years, okay. I think. They often like top, more, top charts. Like Norway always has to come top of the HDR, doesn't it? Otherwise, they change the way they calculate it. <laughs> All right. Okay, I'm, Next, I'm pretty confident about this one. Are, are you? Okay. We'll come, to you. we'll come to you first then. So, Chile. Do you think Chile is higher or lower than first? Now, I'm, I'm, let's think about how how this could be possible. Jeff, what do you think now? I'm tempted to go higher again, but it's first already, so I'll go lower. I'll go lower. <laughs> Jeff's gone. Jeff's gone lower. So have Rohi Mine, Ro um, Drexton. What about you, Holly? What do you think? I mean, I think it's very unlikely that Chile is joint first with Finland. So again, I'm going to have to go lower. Okay, let's have a look. Who's right? Are we are we right? We are indeed right. Chile comes 39th. So quite considerably lower. I'm back Next, in the up <laughs> Next up we've got Afghanistan. Okay, so we want to know whether Afghanistan is higher up the list or lower down the list than Chile. An interesting one. Let's see what the team on YouTube think today. Rebecca's gone for lower. So has Georgia. Let's just have a couple more. Who else is willing to say? Drexton's gone lower. Ben's gone lower. sid has gone higher, though. Holly, what do you reckon? I reckon it may be lower. I'm not thinking kind of very high GDP per capita for Afghanistan. So I think it may that be lower in the World Happiness Report. How about you, Jeff? What are you going to go for? You know, I'm thinking counterintuitively here that uh, I think it's lower. Oh, OK. <laughs> All right, let's have a look. Lots of correct answers there. It was indeed lower. However, we've got one more to play for Nigeria. Oh, this one's a tricky one. So what do we think? Come on, team on YouTube. What do you reckon? Let's get your answers first. Let's have a look. 
Is Nigeria higher or lower than Afghanistan in its World Happiness Report score? Chotul has gone higher. George has gone higher. Rohi's gone higher. Mine's gone higher. James and Ben and Ronald and Inconspicuous Goat and Marcia. Yeah, okay. So these guys all think it's going to go higher. Jeff? Yeah, well, I, I'm impressed with our group. And I, I think there's a lot of corruption in Nigeria. They've taken a trillion dollars out of the ground and they're richer than they were 10 years ago. So I'm going to go higher. I think that they could even be higher than Afghanistan. And you, Holly? I think they're higher than Afghanistan, but I think only by a little bit. I'm not as confident as Jeff about how much higher they are. OK, let's put you out of your misery. Let's have a look. And they are indeed higher. And I think one of the reasons for that is that they've got they tend to have they tend to report quite highly on the subjective happiness report. So in part of the part of the world happiness report comes from the Gallup report. Um, and that is, part of that is done on how people feel they are, how close they are to their their perfect life. And I think the Nigerian people often come out very, very high in their optimism. They often rank very, very highly. And I think that that does kind of pulls them up a little bit as well. Okie dokie. I think that's it. Well, so they're just picking up the scores. YouTube sent us detailed analytics on the scores and all the uh, entries in the chat window. And the news is that uh, the next economic sessions are going to be presented by Rebecca, Ben and <laughs> Inconspicuous Goat, who have just, quote, wiped the floor, according to YouTube, with our economics presenter team. <laughs> but then again, there was no surprise, was it? There, was, there were early signs that, uh, that these uh, team economics tonight was on fire. Amazing, amazing answers. And uh, what a great way to finish as well. Love, love a game of higher or lower. And because of the uh, the extra banter and the extra competition, we've got a couple of seconds over time. But that's fine, isn't it? Because it's economics and it's Easter. Uh, unless you're watching this on replay in 2027, in which case it might be any old time. So uh, fantastic, Isabel. What did you think to that uh, to the to the session? That was a fantastic uh, effort. I think I think we might have had the best the best crowd yet. Then there were some really 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 good people on fire. Lots of really confident answers. I think they're the winners. Yeah, fantastic stuff. Holly, Isabel, Jeff, many, many thanks for taking some time out uh, of your holiday and your evening time to put the session together. Fantastic stuff, uh, but also to, to present it live. Really good. Don't forget, if you like the session, if you found it useful, please, in YouTube tradition, press the thumbs up button. If you didn't like the session, you didn't find it useful, please press the YouTube thumbs up button. And that does two things. Firstly, it helps, uh, obviously, uh, our presenters feel good about themselves. But more importantly, it helps the YouTube algorithm suggest content like this to maybe some other A-level economics students who want to top up their knowledge and understanding of development economics. Um, if you want to watch a replay of this and download the PowerPoint from this 18th, as well as all the other 17 uh, sessions that we've done so far, just go to tutortu.net forward slash live and use the filter to go to A-level economics to fill your boots with uh, downloads and videos and all kinds of other stuff. And as Jeff said, what we'll do, when the, uh, the, the video is live on, um, replay is live on YouTube, we'll add some links into the comments on the YouTube video just to help you find uh, some references to some of the terms we've covered today, like PPD, primary product dependency, which I think was a, a new term for some people on the chat. Uh, fantastic. Many, many thanks for joining us live. We'll hopefully catch you. We have got two sessions a week over Easter. Uh, in the mornings, so uh, something unusual for A-level economic students. You may have to set your alarm for, I don't know, about 9.30, 10.30, so not too bad. Hopefully you can join us live next week and the week after. But from now, from all of us here, have a great Easter holiday. See you later. Take care. Bye-bye.